Uh, my name is Pamela Gaber. I've been directing the Lycoming College Expedition to Adalian since 2002. I've actually been ex directing excavations at Adalian since 1987. Uh, and before that, I was at Adalian as a graduate student starting in 1972. It's a huge site. It's in the um, Mesoria Plain, just south of Nicosia, the capital of Cyprus. And you can see here on the uh, boundary marker for the, the town, it says Dimos Idaliu, which means the people of Idalian. The name of the Modern town is Dali, which of course is short for Idaliu, but um, they recognize their connection to the ancient city. Americans have been excavating at Idalian since 1972, and as you can see, the directors when I was a graduate student were Lawrence Steger and Anita Walker. They excavated in all of these areas, you see marked with blue lines, and when I started in 1987, I began, <coughs> excuse me, on the terrace of the West Acropolis, and here in the lower city, uh, industrial and domestic area, and in the lower city south and lower city east. What I'm talking about today are the what led up to our excavations in this temple in the lower city south. When we were excavating in the lower city north, which is, as I said, the domestic and industrial area, we found a Bothros, which is a sacred depository. When objects in a temple that are consecrated to a god are no longer in use, they bury them in a pit and they build a, an altar on the top and they cover it over and offer a sacrifice in this jar, you see it here in association with the small altar, was full of bone ash and it had one distal end of a caprid radius. If you're not a professional, that's leg of lamb. It was a burnt offering to consecrate and seal this sacred deposit. 1992, we located this. 1995, we excavated it. And here you will see, with the section we left intact, the empty uh, Vothros, as it's called, sacred pit. It is four and a half meters wide and two and a half meters deep. It was uh, full of objects. Um, I had already spent some time digging, you see here, Field T. That is the Adonis Temenos. It's an outdoor sacred grove to the god Adonis. And I did not want any more temples or sacred anything. I'm an aging hippie, and I'm only interested in domestic and industrial stuff, the real people's lives. So knowing that this Bothros was way up here in the northern end, of the lower city domestic area, I said, we're going way south, just below what, what turned out to be a store jar factory that had been excavated by the Department of Antiquities. So if you look at the topographic map, you will see this terrace is this terrace in the photograph. And up above is this store jar factory excavated by them. So I said, aha. We'll lay our trenches just at the foot of that and we'll get the oldest industrial. No, what we found in fact was the temple from which that sacred pit received its objects. In fact, this sherd was in that sacred pit. And as we excavated in this deep sounding that you see on the screen, just on the floor above bedrock, we found this sherd, which is actually a piece of the same pot. So even if I had wanted to think that it wasn't the same temple, it was. I've actually been reporting on this at ASOR since 2004. So for some of you, this is, um, it, it is familiar stuff. We've been referring to it as the sanctuary of the paired deities because we have these two standing stones that we located in 2004. And subsequently, we found uh, images that represent both the master of animals, in this case, a torso of Heracles, and the mistress of animals, in this case, an Artemis um, 
figurine. We have also pan figures and winged, uh, uh, excuse me, horsemen and all kinds of master of animals uh, iconography as well as the Artemis figures we have in various media. So we, we've been equating these standing stones with the master and mistress of animals and referring to the temple as the sanctuary of the paired deities. This all began to change in 2014. But first you have to know that this sanctuary, this is that deep sounding I showed you a minute ago, has been, was in use from the 11th century BCE through the geometric period, Cypro-archaic period, Cypro-classical, 4th century, the Hellenistic, and then the Romans in their inimitable fashion. You can see all of these are adjustments. These, these were floors that related to the rebuilds on this formidable wall. Um, and then the Romans come in and cut all the way across everything right down to bedrock. You can see the continuation of this wall on the other side, and they just <coughs> plowed right through it. Um, one of the features of this temple, which has gone on now, we, we are at 42 meters in length by 26 meters um, north-south, and we, have, we only just finally found one exterior uh, boundary of this temple. Um, it's huge. One of the features is lots and lots of stone-built altars. You can see here uh, a pair of them that we'll be talking about. Uh, and each of these has with it an, an ash pit. Here you can see uh, one that's very like other altars on Cyprus, and here you see is the ash pit associated with it. Um, this particular altar is in the same trench as the standing stones we've been looking at. Um, these two squares are, are grid squares, East New and East Mu 15. You can see them here side by side. And here are the altars we've been talking about. Um, uh, in a closer view, you can see that these altars are not very much alike, except that they are. this one has um, cut sandstones on the top with a limestone underneath. And this one has um, all limestone field stones. But they do both have associated uh, ash pits. Now, this altar we've been looking at um, is very like the stone-built altars, even the same uh, rectangular blocks at the end as these altars from Vuni on the north coast. And this altar, um, the one with the sandstones on top, is a dead ringer for the late Bronze Age altar uh, from Kition on the south coast, reported by Vasos Kariorgis in his excavation reports. Now, in 2012, we decided we were going to investigate the um, founding levels of these altars, and you can see uh, that these two next to each other appear to lie on the same floor, contiguous floor, and that floor dated to 600 BCE, so we thought these were relatively late altars, and here is the floor that dates them. Um, the, the really old altar turned out to be this funky one with the sandstones on the top, and the 600 BCE level, that was the same floor uh, that related to the others, is indeed connected to this altar, but way up here. Underneath and behind, we have 12th century late bronze and proto-geometric levels on this side of the altar. So um, we, we know that in various places in this sanctuary, they are worshiping and working in the 12th century BCE. Here's some of the, the uh, late bronze pottery that we found in association with it. So this is the square, you see the altar here, <coughs> excuse me, and some of the very early deposits behind it. Um, what you'll notice is there are a lot of bedrock pits that we've been reporting on um, for several years in this uh, context. Some of these had lots of late Bronze Age material in them. But you will notice that our soundings left us with this 
we called it the triangle for obvious reasons, unexcavated area. So in order to complete this trench, we decided in 2015, we were going to dig out the triangle. And much to our surprise, it was nothing like what we expected we would find. We thought, oh good, we're going to get all the late Bronze Age stuff. No, it's Hellenistic. How is that possible? Well, you see this feature. It's actually a plaster constructed basin that mirrors these earlier circular bedrock pits. In association with that, you can see just under the altar right here, where they cut away a, a rectangular area and clearly were shoring up the underpinnings of this altar in the same period. This is all Hellenistic. And you can see the edges of their pit where they cut into the earlier material to build these installations, which fundamentally restore the nature of this installation with its pits, its offering tables, and the extremely ancient venerated altar. Who knew? <laughs> the standing stones we've been talking about, as I said, since 2004. Um, they've often been compared now both by us and by Israelis, uh, and of course Garth Gilmore, who worked with us for four years to the standing stones in the, the De Vere, in the Holy of Holies at Arad. Um, and by most people, it's recognized that since ours were found in situ, undisturbed, this may well have been the, the uh, configuration in which those in southern Israel were originally situated. And it was because of these standing stones, as I told you at the beginning, that we were referring to this as the sanctuary of the paired deities. So in 2012, we began to take them out. And as I reported here two years ago, um, we immediately found two things. This entire floor on which you see Chelsea Reimer excavating here, she is leaning on a 10 centimeter thick Pise floor into which this ash pit with the two standing stones is set. They were all laid at exactly the same moment. And underneath it, we found this mass of charred wood. Uh, some of the larger pieces were protected by this shaved amphora base. When we took those out here, you can see some of the huge chunks of charcoal. Uh, we found these uh, uh, fifth century attic black glazed pottery in the Pise, what we call the crust. It's the floor that was overlaid. And underneath, once we got under all of this ash, we found these white platforms, which I reported on two years ago. The um, wood was analyzed for us at the Weizmann Institute, and it was identified as Mediterranean oak, which is also known as home oak. Its Latin name is Quercus ilex. Some of you who work in Israel are familiar with these huge Mediterranean oak trees they can be two meters around if they're extremely old, and they can grow to 30 meters tall. Um, the suggestion is that there were standing wooden poles, probably objects of veneration, much as we have references in biblical literature to poles that were objects of veneration in uh, folk religion, or shall we say, the religion of ordinary people. What you're looking at on the screen right now is a terracotta uh, model of what appears to be a tree trunk that has been cut off. It has a pot of some kind of liquid and birds around the top. It has a pot down below and three people who have their arms outstretched facing it. They are either addressing themselves to the tree or they're dancing, or they are performing some ritual about which we know nothing. But clearly, trees or poles of wood were important to them in some way. In 2010, I reported in this venue that we had found a first century Roman period of ash pit in an area um, 
where we later found a lot of cooking uh, installations. And in the bottom of this ash pit is this uh, rectangular, it's really very square, pit with plaster. In the base of the plaster, you could clearly see the grains of a wooden pole that was square in section. And again, it was in this oval ash pit, the same shape ash pit as the standing stones were found in. So standing poles of wood it, associated with ash were very important in this sacred area. Um, it was Garth Gilmore, who I'm sure most of you know, worked with us for five years on these, um, the standing stones. Uh, he decided in 2013 it was time to excavate the battle. There was, in fact, a third stone in this trench, but it was a, an igneous rock from the top of the Trodos mountain range set in a pit. Uh, and we had been talking about this for a long time. There are lots of parallels for this. Here's the battle. Uh, from the sanctuary of Aphrodite, so-called, the Wanasa in uh, Palais Paphos. And here are coins from Paphos, which represent the conical um, betel representing the goddess. Um, when we went back and looked at the platforms, as we removed more and more of this 5th century floor, we realized that instead of two, we had three platforms. And finally, the penny dropped. Uh, I'm slow, but I get there in the end. And I realized that we had two standing stones of similar uh, size. And then we had this separate betel, which was given very special treatment. When we looked at what, the remains of what we had, the burnt wood underneath, it looked as if we had two platforms of similar size, one slightly smaller, and one much smaller larger. So it seems to me now that what we were dealing with was a primary deity, all of them aniconic, um, and probably a xoanon of the sort that we are told was the first representation of Hera in the sanctuary on Samos in the 8th century BCE. And our sources tell us that she was, she was, a crudely carved wooden pole. I'm sure you're aware that in 2012, um, in the valley of Ansanto near Salerno, they found in a sixth century sacred cave, they found this xoanon. And this is most likely to be the sort of thing that was in the Hireon at Samos. What ours looked like, we have no way of knowing except to look at the coins from Paphos, and you will see that there is not only this large triangular betel in the middle, but two smaller ones on the side, one slightly larger than the other. So rather than the sanctuary of the pair of deities, we don't want to call it the sanctuary of the three deities. What if we find another one? So we've been referring to it as the city sanctuary ever since, and that's that covers us, we don't have to count. Um, I'd just like to call your attention to the fact that a primary aniconic deity, often represented by a sacred tree or standing pole, um, is referred to in Ezekiel's description of the temple in Jerusalem in his vision, Ezekiel 43, 44. He says there's a repeated frieze of a sacred tree flanked by guardians. Um, and of course, this is something we see on late Bronze Age stands like this one. We also see these guardians on either side of, or we did, if it's still there, at Ein Dera, the Phoenician temple in North Syria, which had two um, standing poles out front with vegetal capitals. And of course, the famous Tanakh stand where you have the uh, beasts on the side and the two goats and the tree of life in the middle. Very, very common. So I suspect that's what we're looking at here. The standing stones themselves, instead of being the primary deities, were the guardian figures, the keruvim in Hebrew, the cherubs in English. 
Uh, not little fat babies with wings, but big sphinxes with wings. And the battle would have been the standing stone representing the Wanasa. Lest you think that's all we did <laughs> in 2015, we also expanded to the west, excuse me, to the east from the west and discovered a change in orientation of the architecture where everything has been going north, east, south, west, uh, and at right angles to that, suddenly in the Hellenistic period, they begin to build north, south, east, west, and we have this change of orientation. So we had been investigating this area. One of the problems we have had from the beginning, we started here in 1998, is that we have lots and lots of that very deep 12th, 11th century stuff, and we have lots and lots of Roman and Hellenistic stuff. We even have in this area, as reported on a couple of years ago, archaic and geometric material. We were missing classical floors. Well, we found them. In 2015, we found a series of five classical floors right up to the Hellenistic floors we had reported on uh, previously. And so now we've filled in the gap. We have a complete sequence from the actually 12th century right up to the Roman period. So that covers us in terms of chronology. Uh, the other thing that happened, happened in the farthest west squares we had opened. We're in our closing phase. All we were trying to do here is to take out box and connect all the areas that are previously dug. So sure enough, in the farthest west squares in the last week, according to the laws of archaeology of the season, we found what we had basically been looking for for 15 years, the Roman gateway to the sanctuary. And if you look, you can see these enormous cut blocks, uh, evenly spaced with a gap of two and a half meters between them. And on the west side of these, where it's been excavated, we haven't cleared it on this side, there is a pavement on the outside. This raises all kinds of questions, which we hope to answer in the future. That is, if this is the entryway over here, uh, it looks as though there is a defined interior and exterior space. Does that imply public and private? Is this a place where worshipers could go, but only officiants could go over here? Was this part accessible and this part inaccessible? We don't know. Uh, we will, however, be asking those questions because as you can see, um, this uh, uh, um, sequence that includes the water installation that we reported on um, going back to the archaic period is bisected by this line. So it looks as if, if we're correct as in our speculation, there would have been an officiant on this side and the worshipers would have been out here. So, that's what we hope to discover in the future. And if we are allowed to complete our two-year plan just to take out the box and connect all the dots, um, we should be able to answer that last question. And as always, our thanks go to Lycoming College, the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus, CARI, the AIA, the Fulbright Commission, the Western Sovereign Bases Archaeological Association, and Frank Garrett, and our hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and students. Thank you.